Uh, good morning, everyone who's online. I'm just going to give this a minute or two just to enable people to join. So I'll probably start speaking on the more complicated stuff in, or as I say, about a minute's time. OK, I think it's past 11 o'clock, so it's probably time for me to start talking and um, hopefully more people will be joining as we go along. Just as an introduction, my name's Stephen, Stephen Robson. I'm a solicitor with the Disability Law Service, and that's a charity which pretty much does what it says on the tin. We're a law centre providing advice and help for people with disabilities, especially in the areas of employment, community care, benefits and housing. And this talk is to cover employment aspects and issues, which is my specialist subject, which have arisen during the current coronavirus crisis. Um, it's one of those areas where when the crisis started, the government rushed through various pieces of legislation but as is often the case when you have legislation which is brought in quickly, um, lots of issues arise. And I've been sent uh, some questions which people have sent in already, which I'll try to answer. But before that, I'll just do a quick recap of what the situation is with employment law since the crisis started. Obviously, I'm not going to give a, a law lecture here because I don't think that's what people want. But the thing which you should rem be aware of is that the existing employment law relating to unfair dismissal, discrimination, the right to be paid, none of that has changed as in, in the current circumstances. What has been brought in are some changes to the rules regarding statutory sickness pay and then also a job retention scheme, which enables employers who have decided to furlough their staff, that is effectively to ask them to stay at home and not do any work, to reclaim the bulk of their salaries from a central fund. That, the fact that that fund is there doesn't require employers to place somebody on furlough, but it does help if you have an understanding employer and you feel you're vulnerable. But we'll come on to that in dealing with some of the questions. Other pieces of legislation are still in existence. So there's the obligation of employers to look after the health and safety of employees and also the right to take off time if you have dependents. But that's not something which often helps. But the main thing to remember is that your existing employment rights aren't affected by the legislation which has come in. As I said, I don't want to just speak here to giving a law lecture, which would be much more suitable for other lawyers rather than people who are looking for help. So what I'm going to do is go through some of the questions which I've been sent in advance. I don't know have names for them, so I don't know, so I won't be able to reference you if you have sent in something in advance when you do that, I'll just have to say what the question is and answer it. And then if you'd like to comment as I go along, just type in your message. I'll hope to cover all of them. And if you have any questions or comments, just type them in and I'll pick up as many as I can. We've got until 12 o'clock to do this. So if we keep going till then, that's fine. We'll see, see how it goes. The first question I was going to look at, it's uh, as I say, I don't know who it's from. It's from somebody who works in a nursery which has stayed open and has a child. So because if you, because of this, because of working in a nursery, you're counted as a key worker because um, 
the government said inst some institutions have to stay open for the entire period. The issue this person has is that they have a child, they have, they're a single parent, because they're a key worker, they've been entitled to send their child to school for the entire period, but the school's only open from quarter to nine until half three, whereas the, the nursery where they work want, expect, wants them to work from 7.15 in the morning until six in the evening, which is obviously much longer than school is open and presents child care difficulties. The question that this obviously raises is whether those hours which the nursery is wanting the employee to work are actually your normal hours because your normal employment contract will remain the same. And so if you're only contracted to work for a period which meets the normal school hours, there's no, your employer wouldn't be able to force you to work longer longer hours so hopefully with that in mind the employer would have to appreciate that you could only work normal hours that work for childcare. but um the, the difficulty everybody faces that is that not all employers are reasonable ultimately if you do have care obligations it's possible to take time off for dependence but unfortunately that that would always be unpaid time but here I would think the situation would be that you could simply say, I'm only can, obliged to work these hours and those are the ones I'm going to do. Obviously, you don't want to be too confrontational about it, but ultimately, you need to provide childcare in these situations. Moving on, I've got a question from somebody who works in a supermarket where, again, as they're a key worker and their employer is insisting that they continue to work, unless they've been put in the shielding category and can provide medical evidence. As if they're not in the shielding category, what they're asking, what their rights are and what steps their employer should be taking. Just to take a step back, the shielding category is for people who the government re regard as extremely vulnerable to the COVID-19, so that if they be, did become infected, they're going to have much more serious consequences. People who are, have been, are in that shielding category will be informed by their GP or by NHS England, and they were required to self-isolate for 12 weeks from when they were notified that they were extremely vulnerable. Now, if you are extremely vulnerable, your employer would have to accept that fact, and if they, you could work from home, you'd be entitled to do so, but if you can't work from home, they can't expect you to attend work. And therefore, the ideal solution would be for them to furlough you so that they could reclaim the salary, your salary from the central funds. Ultimately, the difficulty there is that they, whilst they are entitled to furlough you, there's no requirement on their, them to do so. And it can lead to difficulties there because ultimately if you say I'm not coming to work because I've been told to self-isolate all you're going to be entitled to is statutory sick pay which is not a huge amount every week but for somebody who's not in that highly vulnerable sorry extremely vulnerable category and who has an employer who requires them to come into work the government guidance is that the, your employer is under a, an obligation to you know, carry out a risk assessment to make sure that work is safe for you if you are vulnerable rather than just a normal employee. Also, if you have employees who are vulnerable, they should place those in the least vulnerable posts in the workplace. So I'm thinking in the supermarket, uh, even though they've put plastic screens up everywhere, somebody working on the checkouts or in the aisles is going to be more exposed to members of the public and potentially be exposed to the virus. So if it's possible to have somebody working behind the scenes, you're going to probably be safer. So the best advice, if you're in that category where you can't tell your employer that you, you're required to isolate and 
therefore do need to go to work is that you've got to point out to them that you're vulnerable and therefore you should be placed in the least vulnerable place. Ultimately, if you feel that your employer has not provided a safe environment for you to work, you know, despite everything they've done, you're still at risk if you go to work, then the ultimate thing is to say that you don't think that you can attend work for health and safety reasons. There are provisions in the Employment Rights Act which say that if you have a reasonable belief that attending work would be would present an imminent danger to your health, then you're entitled not to attend work and you shouldn't be penalised in any way, including you know, that would cover warnings or being dismissed because you have declined to work for health reasons. Now, it's a very difficult situation at the moment because if you have an employer who says we've covered all possible risks and you, we expect you to come to work and you say, I don't think you have and I think I'm st still at risk if I attend work, um, the two positions are incompatible. Ultimately, it depends on whether your belief that it's not safe for you to attend work is a reasonable one. I think if it ever came before an employment tribunal, they would be quite willing in the current circumstances to accept that you had a, a reasonable belief that there was a danger to you in those circumstances. But until this actually happens in, in a, a claim, we can't, we can't be certain. But as I say, whilst we'd hope that most employers would be understanding in these circumstances, that's the ultimate recourse if they, if they are being uh, unhelpful. I have another question asking what you can do if your employer is requesting written evidence that you need to self-isolate. Now, I just note here that there is a difference between the need to self-isolate and the need to shield. The need to shield is what people who are regarded as extremely vulnerable have to do. They're the people who will be being written to by their GP or by NHS in England and told to self-isolate for 12 weeks from the start of the crisis. If you're in that situation, you just need to send a copy of that letter to your employer and they'll appreciate that you're not, not able to attend work, although they can obviously ask you to work from home. As regards self-isolation, self-isolation is what you're required to do if you show symptoms of COVID or you share a house with somebody who's showing those symptoms or as of this week, if you're contacted by the track and trace service and told that you have been in contact with somebody and they require you to self-isolate. Um, if you show symptoms, I think you're required to self-isolate for a minimum of seven days. And if the symptoms have gone by then, it passes. But if you share a house with somebody who's showing symptoms, you have to self-isolate for at least 14 days. Now, the position for providing evidence of the need to self-isolate is, is that in the past, you'd go to the GP and get a fit note if you've shown symptoms, because that's not practical under the current crisis. What you do is go online and the government have a online portal for obtaining a self-isolation note. It's a fairly straightforward website which guides you through, just asks you a few questions. And at the end of the process, you get emailed a self-isolation note confirming that you do need to self-isolate and therefore can't attend work which you can send to your employer. And once they have that, you'll be entitled to be paid statutory sick pay. And under the current regulations, the, the statutory sick pay starts from day one of your self-isolation rather than day four, which would have been the normal situation in the, in the past. So I hope that covers that question. Just had an online question from Sharon asking, can we be classed as disabled due to your condition so because of renosal aroma? Now, unfortunately, that's a very vexed question, but it's one which probably we do need to talk about. 
the, the, whether you are disabled for the purposes of employment law ultimately comes down to whether you meet the definition of disability which is set out in the Equalities Act and comes out as a typical piece of legislation. It says that you're disabled if you have a mental or physical condition which is long term and which has a substantial adverse effect upon your ability to carry out normal day-to-day -day activities. It's a bit of a mouthful of that, but what it means is that for most conditions, simply having a diagnosis of Raynaud's or something else doesn't automatically mean that you're considered disabled. There are a few conditions, it's cancer, MS, being HIV positive, which if you're diagnosed with those, you're automatically considered to be disabled. But for all other conditions, once you have a diagnosis, the question of whether you're disabled depends on the degree to which that condition affects you. And Raynaud's and the like, as with many other conditions, they don't affect everybody to the same degree. So ultimately, you have to pass a tick box test to say, is your condition long term, which you know, these conditions certainly are because they're lifetime conditions, but do they have a substantial effect upon your ability to carry out normal day to day activities? It, <laughs> it, it depends. For most people, the answer there is it depends. And you have to look at whether what effect your condition is having on you from day to day. In normal circumstances, if you do have a condition, many employers will ask you to get an occupational health assessment because they'll want to know whether they need to make any adjustments for you. And most occupational health assessments say at the end, we do or do not believe that this person is covered by the definition of dis disability in the Equalities Act but they then cover themselves by saying, ultimately, it's not for us to say. Going through some more questions, I've got a question from someone who says, I'm over 70 with sy systemic sclerosis, uh, affecting lungs and digestive tract, and is, is a patient at the Royal Free, and they also have hypertension. They work, but they've taken themselves into isolation because they're worried about contracting COVID due to their underlying condition. But they say their employers are asking for a letter to cover their job and salary whilst they're away from work. The difficulty here, as I've alluded to, is that you only get a letter saying you're not allowed to work if you're classed as being extremely vulnerable. You don't get that if you, you're simply concerned about the fact that if you do get COVID, it will be more serious for you than other people. So just being worried about being, being uh, vulnerable to, to the condition doesn't give you any extra rights. And therefore, if you say, say ultimately, if you say in these circumstances, I'm not prepared to come to work because I'm concerned that I might contract COVID, the, your employer would maybe say, well, you're not going to get paid for that time. And ultimately, although I think it'd be quite surprising, they could say failure to attend work is a disciplinary matter. But against that, as I've alluded to earlier, they do have an obligation to look after your health and safety. And if you've got a reasonable belief that attending work would be, it would put your health at risk, then you will be able to say, I can't attend work because of this, because I'd be at risk. And in those circumstances, you're protected from being disciplined or dismissed because that would be, you know, that's covered by the Public Inter Disclosure Act. But ultimately, unfortunately, the simple fact that you are concerned about your health, unless you're in the extremely vulnerable condition, the concern doesn't give you a right to not go to work if you are con considered a key worker and you're unable to work from home and your employer's insisting upon it. It's just a question of what the risk 
would be to you and whether you can say, I can't attend because of the risk to my health. Obviously, the ideal solution in these circumstances is that your employer places you on furlough and reclaims the money from the, the government. But um, you, you would hope that an, empl an understanding employer would do so. But uh, in the real world, there are a lot of employers who aren't sufficiently understanding. I just had another question come up from Avtar asking what if an employer ignores the shielding 12 week letter and demands that you go in. The shielding 12 week letter from the from your doctor or from NHS England is an instruction to you to avoid all social contract and not to go out during that 12 week period. So you cannot be required to attend work and whilst your employer you may only be entitled to statutory sick pay during that time. Uh, your employer can't discipline you or dismiss you for failing to attend work because the, the instruction from the government overrides that. So if you do get that instruction, you just have to say, I'm sorry, I, I can't do that. Just moving on, and apologies if <laughs> this that amount of just reading out questions but that you need to understand what I'm answering. Next question I've got is 62 year old woman with systemic sclerosis who works they're not in the shielding category but have taken themselves into isolation because of the concern and their employer requires a medical note to cover their job. This is very similar to the, the previous one uh, and as I say unfortunately if the simple fact that you're concerned doesn't entitle you to necessarily avoid work. Um, if you can reasonably say the risk to me at work is too great, therefore I am going, I, I, I'm staying at home for health and safety reasons, you're, you're, you're safe from being penalised, although you probably wouldn't be entitled to get any payment for that, that period. But without a, a letter specifically instructing you to, to shield and to stay off work, it's not possible to, to demand that your employer agrees to that. Or, and as I say, it's not impossible to demand that they furlough you. As I keep going through these questions. I have a question from someone who works at a local hospital and they've been informed that they're, they're wanted to go back to work despite their having been diagnosed with sclerodema and secondary Raynaud's. They're not in the shielding category, but they don't feel comfortable returning to work due to their condition, putting them at higher risk. It, again, it's a similar situation. If you are a key worker and your employer says, we want you to, to come into work, because obviously in those circumstances, you can't work from home, they're entitled to do so. If you refuse to do so on the grounds of health and safety and you have you can show that you had a reasonable um, feeling that you'd be putting yourself at risk if you attended, you can decline to do so and it's very unlikely that they'd be able to discipline you. But um, as the downside to that is in those circumstances you're unlikely to be able to be paid or even claim statutory sick pay because the reason you're not at work isn't because you're sick and it's not because you're you've been told to self-isolate you're just concerned about the risks next question somebody says my mother has scleroderma and has been experiencing symptoms of the coronavirus i need to stay at home and care for her am i allowed time off and what pay am i entitled to in these circumstances, if you're, as I mentioned earlier, if you live with somebody who's showing the symptoms of COVID, um, you are required to self-isolate for a minimum period of 14 days. So yes, you can stay at home for those 14 days and provide care to the person who's showing the symptoms. You are entitled to statutory sick pay, even though you're not actually sick, but because you're required to self-isolate, you'll be paid SSP from day one of that isolation period. 
once the 14 days that you're required to self-isolate is up, if your relative still requires care, um, if you had an understanding employee, that you'd hope that they would appreciate that and let you take that time. If they won't, there is another statutory right, which is the right to take time off for dependents. And obviously, if you have somebody living with you who's suffering from COVID symptoms, they're certainly going to be regarded as a symptom, uh, as a dependent. And the, the, the regulations there say that you're entitled to reasonable time to provide that care. Uh, in the coronavirus crisis, that time is likely to be however long it takes for the, the sufferer to recover. And in normal circumstances, the right to time off to, to provide care only extends until such time as it would be reasonable to find an alternative source of care. But at the moment, obviously, that's not readily available. So I think it would be potentially an extended time. The downside is that whilst you get statutory sick pay for the 14 days that you have to self-isolate, if you're simply taking time off for dependence, that that runs out. Just re reading the questions which are coming up at the moment. A question from Karen, who has a daughter who's classed as very high, high risk and I think is shielding because they have a letter. Karen's currently furloughed, but is asking what happens if at the end of the shield, 12 week shielding period, and if the furlough period comes to an end because she doesn't feel that it's safe for her to work and then to to come home. Again, this is unfortunately an area which isn't fully covered in the regulations which come in. For people who are shielding, the guidance from the government says that they have to maintain as much self-isolation at home as possible, which in most people's home may not be an awful lot. And the guidance doesn't require that people who live with them have to self-isolate as well. It just so says that you have to maintain the maximum social distancing possible um, at, at home. So somebody who works lives with somebody who's shielding but is required to work can still be required to attend work and because there's not the possibility to say that the reason that they're they can't work is because of a health risk to themselves there's not that fallback it would be possible in those circumstances to seek time time off to care for dependents if your daughter is unable to look after herself at home um, but as I've said earlier, that, that's unpaid leave, which is often difficult for people to deal with. Given that the furlough scheme will be extended until October, you would hope that yeah, uh, an understanding employer would be sympathetic if you said, I can't return to work because of the risk to my daughter, can you extend my furlough? And if you have a good relationship with them, that's the best way to approach it if they are not prepared to go down that basis as i say you can take time off for dependence and you know whilst that was unpaid it would hopefully protect your job as and when the the the, the time when it's needed to shield comes to an end On a similar line, I've got a question from Sunset. Somebody says they have a family member on a high risk group who's been shielding because of their scleroderma. They're wary of putting her at risk because they're worried about contracting the virus. Would that be reason enough for her employers to allow her to work from home? Now, 
the general guidance from the government is that well, even though the lockdown is being reduced at the moment, if you can work from home, you should, and therefore employers should un uh, assess all of the jobs which people are doing from them. And if the job can be done from home, they should allow you to do so. I, I would hope in that this situation, the, the fact that you have further duties beyond just the ability to work from home would persuade them that that, that is appropriate. Um, obviously, there are unreasonable employers left, right and centre, but in these circumstances, if you can do the job from home, they, they, they should certainly allow it. I've got another question from Rhonda saying she's got Raynaud's phenomenon DVT and the pulmonary embolism and she's on Revo I can never pronounce the drug names for life. She's asking if she's safe to go back to work next month. Now, I'm assuming that if you've been placed on the shielding, you've been told to shield, then if your GP doesn't think that you're safe to return to work next month, they'll provide you with another letter. Ultimately, it's a medical assessment as to whether you you are safe to do so or not. Obviously, the, you should only re really be required to return to work if your job is one which can't, can't be done from home. If you can work from home, your sh employer should allow you to do so, they, and obviously you get paid for it. If your shielding letter has run out, I think it, you just need to contact your GP to discuss with them whether they believe it's safe for you to return to work your employer does have an obligation for your health and safety and has to consider whether they can, you are able to work safely, especially with your vulnerability. And I go back to the, the right to refuse to work if you have a reasonable belief that your health is at risk if you do so. Again, I'm reading through, through the questions and uh, so, so apologies for not reading things out and summarizing. I have a question from someone who says they've suspected they've got had Raynaud's for years, but have never had a diagnosis as due to the difficulties of getting to see a GP. They're a key worker in a day center for people with learning difficulties. The number of attendees has dropped off. So they're working in an office at the moment with a, and they're concerned that there's no proper social distancing then. They're concerned about contracting COVID, which would make their condition worse. And they'd like to know if they're vulnerable and should be shielding. Now, again, the question of whether you're shielding is whether you're considered to be highly vulnerable. And if you are, it's an assessment for your GP or your consultant to say you meet the tests to be a highly vulnerable person, in which case you should be shielding. What I would say for this person is that as they're no longer working with the, the attendees at the day centre, but are working in an office, it seems that they could could well do that job from home as uh, most office based jobs in, in, at present can be dealt with uh, online and over the internet. So the, the, the sensible thing, way to approach that is to say, my work, the work I'm doing from the at the moment, I'd like to do it from home because I'm a, I'm a vulnerable person and the, the risks to me because of the lack of social distancing are, are enhanced. Um, and again, I'm banging on about health and safety. There should be social distancing at work insofar as it is possible. If the lack of social distancing does give you a, a reasonable belief that there's imminent danger to your health, you can you have a right to refuse to work, but you have to be able to justify that belief. The next question I'm dealing with somebody who says they've taken themselves into isolation as they're worried about contracting COVID with because of their underlying condition. 
but their employers requiring a medical letter to cover the job and salary whilst they're away from work. This comes back to the question of simply having Raynaud's oscleroderma doesn't of itself place you in the highly vulnerable category and therefore you've got no absolute right to say I can't can't attend work. If you the, the difficulty is that the mere fact that you're concerned that of the effect if you do contract COVID is not sufficient to be able to justify not attending work if you are in a key worker position. If you can actually say there are these specific risks to my health and I'm concerned about them, you should be okay. And also your employer should have carried out risk assessments and if they recognise that you are vulnerable, they should put you in the position with the least risk within the workplace. But you can't demand that you should be uh, you should be excused work simply because you are concerned. An interesting question I have now, somebody with limited scleroderma, which doesn't impact their lungs, they're not on medication, they are going to work every day in a, in a factory, but to do so, they have to catch four buses, I'm assuming that's two, two each way, but you know, if it's four buses each way, that's a hell of a journey. They'd like to know what vulnerable classification they come under and whether or not they should be stopping work. Again, unless you're highly vulnerable, you're not entitled to demand that you stop work, but your employer does have to take reasonable steps to protect your health and safety. One of the very vexed questions and one that I can't provide a definitive answer for, I'm afraid, is whether your employer's duty also extends to your journey to and from work, because self-evidently getting on a number of buses every day is going to cause um, quite a few, quite a few issues. But yeah, again, it's something to discuss with your employer. If you say I am vulnerable, I don't think I can attend work because of my condition they probably wouldn't be prepared to pay you for that for that period unless they'd agreed to furlough you and they are enti entitled to do so without having to justify that but and yeah, as i say an understanding employer might well agree to furlough you and simply pay you such money as they can recover from the, the government for that period so that your income is protected but if they won't do so i'm afraid that your your rights are quite limited i've got a question from paula saying that she's been told to shield by the Regional Pulmonary Hypertension Centre until she's been seen by them and has a letter. Um, she works as a district nurse and is asking should she go on sickness absence or, or, or not. Now, if you have been instructed to shield beyond the initial 12 week period, that would effectively be regarded as sickness absence, which you're, you should be entitled to claim your contractual sick pay if you have uh, that within your job, or at the very least statutory sickness pay. Um, if you're in a situation where you're, you, do, you would only get statutory sick pay in those circumstances, again, the best option is to ask your employer to, to furlough you so that they can pay you the bulk of your salary with, at no expense to themselves and a reasonable employer should, should do that because it won't cost them anything. The difficulty is that a lot of employers don't necessarily appreciate this and don't, don't do it. Now Paula says that she works as a district nurse, so if she had, if you're working for an NHS trust, um, 
the government guidelines said that public sector bodies shouldn't be apl applying to the job retention scheme for money to cover furloughed employees. So that may be a complication. Against that, my understanding is that jobs within the health service in general, once you've, if you've got enough service you and you're on sickness absence, you're entitled to full pay for up to six months and then a half pay for another six months. So hopefully that would cover any time until uh, until you're actually seen by the clinic and the position can be resolved. And you never know, the whole crisis may have passed by then, but you know, don't hold your breath. Checking on the questions coming in. So I had a letter from Tina saying that she's been diagnosed with scler scleroderma and Raynaud's plus has hypertension. She hasn't had a shielding letter, but because she's got hypertension, the nurse thinks to say, says that she should have done. Um, again, this is a situation where if you think you should be in the highly vulnerable group and you haven't actually had a letter, it's worth just getting in touch with your doctor in a situation where the practice nurse says you should be in the, the, the highly vulnerable class and should get a letter. Um, you would hope that most GPs would take the take it the the view of the of the nurse and agree to that. But ultimately, it's a medical assessment. I think that there are guidelines for determining whether your symptoms are sufficiently serious to be put you put into the highly vulnerable group. But that's outside my special area. After I was come back with another question asking whether furlough can be used if a company is still trading, as his employer said, no, it can't. The answer to that is yes, it can. Um, the job retention scheme does allow an employer to furlough some employer, employees and not others because obviously there are businesses which they're not closing down completely, but they need to have just a reduced number of employees. If an employee is furloughed, the rules under the job retention scheme say that the employer can reclaim 80% of their salary for three week periods. And what sometimes happens is that companies who are, furlough, are just reducing staff are rotating the ones that they're furloughing every three weeks. But if you're a vulnerable employer, employee, Yes, they can furlough you and claim back from the job retention fund. So that, that should cover that. Now. I, I think that at the moment covers all of the questions I've been sent, sent so far. The, there's a big overlap between them, so rather than re read them out repetitively and give repetitive answers, I, I hope that I've covered all of those. So what I'm looking at is for more questions on the on the live stream, if you have any, just get them typed in. And apologies, I thought whilst I'm scrolling up and down it. Okay, well, what I'm going to do is just recap the basic advice which I've probably been going on and on and on about since the start of this talk, is the fact that if you are, your condition is such that you're considered 
highly vulnerable, you should receive a letter from NHS England or from your GP or from your consultant. And that requires you to self-isolate for a minimum period of 12 weeks. In those circumstances, you can't attend work, but it would seem that you're regarded as being on sickness absence for that period, which obviously means you may only get statutory sick pay, but it's still possible to work from home if your job is one where that is appropriate. So um, look, look for that. If you haven't been told that you're highly vulnerable, but you think that you are vulnerable, then, then it's a question you need to take up with your doctor or consultant if you want to be moved into that category. Just had another question whether pe people can be furloughed even though they've had a shielding letter. Again, yes, you can be. Um, it's you know, it, applying for the job retention scheme is different to the is, is is different to the to being furloughed. Being furloughed is effectively being placed on garden leave, and if your employer does that. Mr. Weish to pay you, although you can agree to take less, but the job retention fund is there so that they can recover 80% of your salary from the government. And the mere fact that you have a shielding letter doesn't stop them doing that. As I said a few minutes ago, you can work from home even if you have a shielding letter, so that's not a problem. Now, if you're in a situation where you're not having to shield, but you are concerned that that you're, it's not safe for you to attend work. Now, ultimately, if, you're, if your employer isn't understanding, won't place you on furlough and keeps demanding that you attend work, they won't agree to you working from home. If you can justify your belief that it's not safe for you to attend work, then you're entitled to say, I, 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 I'm not going to attend work for, for health reasons. And because of the provisions of the Employment Rights Act, you'd be entitled not to, to, to do so and you shouldn't be subject to any detriment because of that. But you know, if the employer is reasonably saying there's nothing, no problem, um, it becomes more com complicated and there's no definite answer to that as yet. But in general, I think a tri tribunal would be sympathetic in those situations and so would you know, would agree that you shouldn't be punished by being dismissed or otherwise disciplined for because you have a reasonable belief of the dangers Sorry. Got a letter, uh, a question. Somebody says their son, son's company agreed to him working from home due to them being at high risk, but due to lung, lung fibrosis and scleroderma. That was agreed before 21st March lockdown. So far they've been supportive, but there's obviously a concern about if he is required to work from work in the office, he might be more vulnerable to contracting the virus and therefore infecting the, the person at home. It's a difficult situation if, if that happens. You would very much hope that an employer, if they've agreed that he can work from home, would agree to continue that. The government guidance is that if any job can be done from home, the government should that the employer should agree to continue that. Um, I think in those circumstances, it would most likely be a question of putting your foot down to a degree and saying, there's too much risk to my family if I do return to work. It's possible for me to do, do my job from home and therefore I can't do so. It's a difficult question and it's slightly hypothetical because it hasn't arisen yet. All the government guidance says about people who have to shield is that the people who live with them can continue to work and they just have to observe highly effective social distancing within the house. But um, 
that's not always possible. So we can't guarantee that you, know, you would be safe. Um, obviously, there are cases we hear about people who have uh, who have decided to isolate themselves from their family, but I don't think that people should be required to do that simply to attend an office when they can actually do their work from home. I think it's so unlikely that an employer would be able to to justify dismissing but the danger here in this case I see that the, the son doesn't have two years service with his employer which means that you know not actually a protected employee which means that an employer doesn't actually have to have a justified right to to actually terminate your employment so you are to agree an employer uh, an employee at at whim, so it's important to stay on best terms with them. <laughs> I'm sorry if that sounds a bit waffly, but the rights are limited, but it's generally re involves referring your employer to the government guidelines and hoping that they are reasonable. Anyway, as we don't have any more questions coming in, I hope I've covered everything that needs to people that want to talk about obviously if you do have any further questions um i'm available i think my details or at least the disability law services details are available on the information that was sent out so we're happy for anybody to get in contact with us so that we can provide them with advice on employment matters but uh other than that, I think that uh, I hope that this has been helpful for everybody and uh, best of luck with getting through the crisis. So goodbye now.